Yeah, well, God's uh, God's self act of self naming to Moses in the desert is something approximating I am that I am, or I will be what I will be. And it's very difficult for me not to see a direct analogy between that and the claim that identity is subjectively defined. I am that I am. And that's something like the attribution of omniscience and omnipresence and omnipotence to the subjective self. And it's even worse than that in some sense, because the subjective self there that's being elevated, which is something like what I feel I am, seems to me to be technically indistinguishable from whim. So, because you could imagine that you could regard yourself properly in a selfish sense. And by properly, I mean you would regard yourself as an entity that actually propagates itself across time. And so you're bound by fealty to yourself not to do spectacularly stupid things in the present, even though they might feel good, if they would compromise you tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, right? You have to view yourself as an iterating game. And this notion that identity is somehow subjectively defined and that that subjectivity can be pinned down to the moment couldn't possibly be a claim that's more preposterous and immature. Now, I told the Senate in Canada when Canada passed Bill C-16, which was the pronoun law that every idiot country in the world seems to be jumping on now and passing, that the consequence of confusing people about the difference between men and women would be the production of a psychogenic epidemic. Because I knew knew that young adolescent girls in particular are prone to, well, we've seen like three epidemics in my lifetime, bulimia, anorexia, and cutting. And it was always adolescent girls. And I think there's psychological reason for assuming that the distinction between male and female is the most basic cognitive category. It's the deepest cognitive category. It's the most profound, might be the most sacred in that sense. And that if you throw uncertainty into that, you imagine that there's a hierarchy of of psychological instability. And there are people who are barely clinging to the edge. And there's lots of them, just like they cling economically. If you add uncertainty into the conceptual hierarchy, you make marginal people, you drop marginal people into the realm of insanity. And so I felt that for every one trans child that we hypothetically saved, we'd probably doom a thousand. And that seems to have played itself out with near perfect accuracy over the last six years. And there is some unbelievable narcissism and self-aggrandizement in that proposition that you can define your identity subjectively by whim at any moment and that everyone else has to abide by that as if it's incontrovertible fact. One of the things Carl Jung, the psychoanalyst, said um, back near the end of the Second World War was that, well, he said two things that were quite striking. One was that the biggest threat that was going to confront us in the future would be something like mass psychological instability rather than, let's say, uh, material want and privation per se. And he also pointed out that the logical conclusion of the Protestant Revolution would be that everyone would become their own church, right? That was the degenerative tendency because of the destruction of intermediary intermediary hierarchical systems. One of the things conservatives can offer, and I think this works out well on the front of sanity itself, a front of bolstering sanity, is there is a concept among humanistic psychologists in particular, that the atomized self is the center of the world and that self-actualization is the essence of sanity. But there's a more sophisticated version of that, I would say, stemming mostly from Piagetian thought, that there isn't any difference between sanity and proper nesting inside a hierarchical community. So you can imagine that, well, if your marriage is really unhappy, you're not going to be very sane. And if your children are miserable and misbehaving and your marriage is unhappy, you're even going to be less sane. And that will also be true if your friends have turned against you and you have no position in the community with regard to a job or a career. So it's better to conceptualize identity and sanity as the consequence of proper nesting in a hierarchical social structure so that you're sane if you have a marital partner who provides you with corrective feedback. The two of you have a good marriage and are sane if you are together jointly, back to back, 
in relationship to your children who are then stabilized because of your stability. Now you're nested inside a stable family. You can walk outside of that family into the community and you can orient yourself properly in relationship to a job or career. And that also provides you with corrective feedback from all your compatriots and your peers. And that scales politically at the level of the city and the state and the country. And so sanity and identity then becomes the entire hierarchy of hierarchical relationships. And that's another thing that conservatives can offer as a vision, as an antidote to this atomized liberalism that that results in the final analysis in self-aggrandizement to the point of, of claiming divine attributes. That's how it looks to me anyways.